child, and we, we couldn't be happier that Newby's going to share her wealth of knowledge, her years of experience with all of us today. So, Newby. Thank you for coming, especially those of you who had to come a long way, even though you hadn't planned on coming such a long way. Um, I am a conservator. I've been a conservator since 1977, 1976. Uh, I now have a full-service museum consulting firm. I have a business partner. And we do sort of soup to nut services having to do with clothing collections and textile collections, so quilts, anything that's woven or felted or, or whatever. But I'm also a material cultures historian, and that means I connect the dots, just as you've just been seeing, genealogy with the artifact, uh, decorative arts movement in, in the art history field with the actual artifact and how they relate so that's, that's what I like to do is, I, I say that all of our collections, whether they're personal or institutional, are in fact like a spider web. Everything is related to everything else somehow with the artifact in the middle. Um, very quickly, I got my degree, my undergraduate degree in costume design from Northwestern in 1974, decided as most professional costume designers have to do, but I had to get my Master of Fine Arts. And in the middle of my training, uh, ended up having to make some money, and I went to work for a very well-respected vintage clothing store. Uh, and this was in 75, and she needed what I referred to as sophisticated mending. Well, I very quickly learned that this was not ordinary sewing. Now, I'd been sewing all my life, and making my own clothes, my mother did embroidery for the Episcopal Church. She did all the white work. I mean, there wasn't a needlework project that I hadn't been exposed to in some way, shape, or form. I'd had a needle in my hand since I was a child. Uh, but this was clearly different. At that point, there were no textile conservation programs in the university system. They didn't exist. What happened was the home economics studies fell apart. And there was this gaping hole with all of these PhD textile chemists, textile experts, sitting around these home ec departments, which had done really valuable work for many, many years. And it almost ha it happened simultaneously but independently, mostly in the agricultural schools, in the ag schools. University of Maryland, uh, Cornell in New York, um, East Tennessee University, uh, and the list goes on, Rhode, University of Rhode Island. And independently, there arose um, this study. Also in our museums, there started to be conservators. First, we started off with paintings cons conservation, and then went into the decorative arts, and then eventually we ended up with some really wonderful folks who specialized in textiles. And these gals, mostly gals, uh, some men, started publishing in the professional literature, in the <coughs> journals and newsletters. So I taught myself. I went down to the Textile Museum in Washington, D.C., where I live. I got an au pair for my children. <laughs> and I started reading. And it was an article in Australian Opera News about an 1880s dress that they wanted to use as the blueprint for an opera they were going to be designing. But they first had to get it to the point where it could be handled. And it was the story of how they conserved it. And we start to see on and on and on. And then the American Institute of Conservators started offering workshops. Costume Society had members. And my mentor was Dr. Margaret Ordonez, who ended up chairing the department at the University of Rhode Island. So I've been doing this for a really long time. And I've done it by the seat of my pants in some instances, but also I started out with my hometown museum in Alexandria, Virginia, which is George Washington's hometown. Um, and I realized that the bulk of our textile treasures are in our smaller institutions. Textiles are personal. 
and you want to give them locally if you can. And so my outreach has always been to the smaller underfunded institutions. And through Costume Society, we've done all kinds of programs, <coughs> reaching out over the years. I've been chairman of some of them, blah, blah, blah. So um, I do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see if I can get this thing to do. So you're walking in either to your own attic, your mother or your mother or your grandmother's attic, and your artifacts, in fact, had a past life. Surprise. Uh, they were poorly stored. Just putting it up in the attic seemed fine at the time, but just think of how hot it gets up there, how cold it gets up there. They were exposed to UV light. Even fluorescent light is bad for textiles. There was too much humidity, too little humidity. Uh, there were fires, there were floods. And then, of course, there's what we call inherent vice, and that is the inner workings of the garment and the textile itself is working against its preservation. And we're still seeing that today. Um, you, many of you have come across old lingerie where the elastic is gone. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an inherent vice. Mm -hmm. So we have the ravages of time, <laughs> poor storage which shall remain nameless as to these institutions. Uh, damage from UV light, you can see the fading, mm -hmm. and the desiccation, which is um, what the, how brittle things get mm -hmm. when they dry out. And by the way, if you think of textiles in the same way you think of the skin on your face, you're halfway there. Because all the things that do your face harm do your textiles harm. You don't use, many of us here of a certain age, we no longer use scrubby pads on our faces, right? Um, we don't use harsh creams. We don't use harsh soaps. Degradation of cellulosic textiles or cellulosic fibers. Well, we've all seen that. You put away that white cotton t-shirt in November, and you bring it out in May, and guess what? It's yellow. That just happens to cotton. It turns yellow. That's all there is to it. Uh, acidic environments. Everything turns acidic eventually. That's a chemical reality. So the wedding dress that was put away looking clean, and it comes out of the box 30 years later because the daughter or the granddaughter wants to wear it, and it looks like somebody spit tobacco juice down the front. Mm -hmm. That was champagne. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but that you couldn't see it. Inherent vice, and in, when you're looking at your quilts in particular, you see the dye disintegration. All of these dye formulas were experiments over the years. And a lot of those experiments worked great for the first 10 years, but then they started not to work. Um, it just is a fact. You'll see it especially in brown dyes and red dyes. Those are the harshest, depending on the components. And for dye, it's not just dip it in the bath, which we can do now. But in the old days, you had to put something called a mordant on your fabric. And the mordant was a paste of whatever chemicals were necessary for the color you wanted that made the dye that you were using actually adhere to your fabric. So that's what the print works were doing. And those mordants frequently weren't any good for longevity either. Inherent vice, and we've all seen this, shattered silk. And that comes from the process that was used starting in at the, the second half of the 19th century where people were weighting the silk. They were coating the fibers, either the fabric or the fibers, with chemical salts, which made the silks feel lustrous, and they made the rustle that you liked. And it made cheap silk feel expensive. Well, basically, it's rusting the fabric. Or another analogy is it's overpermed hair. It's like overpermed hair. There's no saving it. It's toast. Oh, you can preserve what's left with adhesives and so forth. But it's like a mirror or a piece of glass that's been broken. You can't ever put it back together again. Um, and they knew about it in the period. The shipping companies knew. They knew that that bale of silk weighed 
far more than it should have. And if you think there isn't waiting as silk today, think again. All of those fabulous silk satin wedding gowns, they've been weighted, only now they're using starch. So if you take silk satin, which you should be able to wash and wash it, you end up with charmeuse, which is silk without the body, and you end up with a nightgown. So even though it might say washable, be careful. More ravages of time, spills that develop over the years. Uh, insect damage, sewing thread that just doesn't hold up. Insect and rodent damage. I just came from helping a friend clean out her, fa her father's house. Let me tell you something. If Walt Disney had ever had to clean up after a mouse, we never would have had Mickey. <laughs> they do awful things, including make nests in your quilts. Or, or moths, as you can see from the saddle blanket on this fabulous Steef elephant at the DAR Museum. And there's more. The 20th century brings you more. In fact, Dr. Ordinez looked at us and said, girls, I leave you the end of the 20th century. <laughs> I'll be retired by then. Well, she's not. And she is having to cope with it. And she's coming out with a book. <laughs> but man-made fibers present their challenges. Metallic buttons and trim. Um, celluloid. Celluloid was an early plastic. It was used to imitate ivory. Jet, you find it in purse handles, you find it in shoe components, you find it in uh, dresser sets, you find it in buttons. If it gets wet, it turns into hydrochloric acid. Yeah, you want to isolate your cellulite. Uh, heavy trims on white light fa lightweight fabrics. Those fabulous dresses from the 1920s, with all that beading on that very sheer silk, and what happens? The shoulders start to shred from the weight. Or those great dresses from the Titanic era, from the World War I era. Again, heavy trims on sheer fabrics. Uh, elastic, we've already covered, lycra. Vinyl, I, anybody have some go-go boots from the 1960s? <laughs> Trust me, they're in worse shape than the 18th century clothing at Williamsburg. All of those oil-based fabrics are not going to survive. Document, document, document. This may be particularly at, um, apropos to anybody working with sports clothing from after World War II, because they're incorporating a lot of these fibers in them. And if you're trying to maintain it, um, there can be some problems. So document, document, document. Get them dressed on forms, take good pictures. And then non-standard standard batting in quilts. You'll find scatter, you know, quilts were made by everybody, including folks that really had no money. And you used whatever you had. And sometimes that stuff ends up damaging the fabric that is sandwiched over, over it. So what you can do, and some of it is so easy, and it's so low tech, you can vacuum. And that is the single most important thing you can do to any textile to save it. You know as well as I do, on the screen of the big t TV, wipe it with a dust cloth. Oh my god, where'd that dust come from? Well, it settles into the weave structure of whatever and acts like little knives. Now, by the way, all of this information is in your handouts, so you're good. Um, <laughs> hydrating. Hydrating is a miracle. Some of you may remember the old technique, if you're going away for a couple of weeks, nobody around to, hide, to water your house plants. You put them in the shower, you cover them with a big piece sheet of plastic, and it ends up creating a little um, humid atmosphere. That's what you can do for your textiles. You can tent them and create a terrarium, if you will, of humidity that the textiles can absorb. It's a wonderful, wonderful technique. You can take boots that have been stored and fell over leather boots, and they're cracked. And if you want to try and straighten them, guess what? They'll break. Put them in a hydration chamber for a couple of days. They'll start to come up like this. You can stuff them with paper, 
then you can get them. My favorite hydration story, I have two, but this one is most illustrative. Um, my friend Gail Strege at um, uh, Ohio State University did an exhibit a few years ago called Fur, Fin, and Feather. So it was everything made of animal skins and furs and feathers. And <clears throat> in the biology department, or one of the science departments, was Admiral Byrd's Arctic, um, our Arctic suit. Excuse me, I'm getting my water. And it was flat as a pancake, stiff as a board. <laughs> she wanted to put that thing on a floor. Well, no way in hell was she going to do it. Not like that. <clears throat> so what did she do? She went to the stadium, and she got one of those ginormous trash cans. She got it clean. She put about six inches of water in the bottom. She managed to wheedle a, a dowel through the arms of the coat. Mm -hmm. And she put that thing in the trash, bag, trash can. And she tented it, and she left it alone. And a week later, she put that thing on the phone. It's amazing. It's amazing. So uh, trust me, that is your vacuuming and hydrating. Fabulous. Sewing stabilization goes without saying. You can go ahead and restitch those seams that are coming apart. Nothing wrong with that. Dry cleaning, sometimes. I have a whole handout on dry cleaning. Wet cleaning, sometimes, and we'll go into that in more detail. And then acid free and supported storage. Again, we're going to be going into that. So here's our vacuuming. What you want, and I brought one, I'll put it out for show and tell. You need a barrier between what you're vacuuming and your textile. And I buy fiberglass window screening at the hardware store. It costs five bucks for a roll. Um, I put some twill tape all the way around it just because I use mine a lot. And I vacuum, but use that as my screen. You don't want to pull up anything except dust. You don't want any fibers going up or any bits of trim. And you want to vacuum it with the grain against the grain, on the diagonal, front and back. You want a little paintbrush to get the dust up out of the pockets, under the collar. Uh, you want a vacuum cleaner with low suction. Not all of them have it. You do not have to buy a Nile Fisk vacuum, the $1,000 version that's sold by the conservation catalogs. There is so much concern about allergies now. You can buy a little vacuum cleaner with a HEPA filter for under $200. And the HEPA is the one that keeps all, everything from going back out the other end and redepositing. Right? Um, keep your hose off. The, don't let the hose gray. Um, I like to use the upholstery tool. It's a nice little tool to use. Uh, if you don't, if you want, you can put a, a nylon stocking with a rubber band over the hose. That keeps stuff from getting up to. You can use your own vacuum cleaner from home if you happen to have one. There's nothing magic about a vacuum cleaner. Low suction, HEPA filter, those are the two magic words. And here's my hydration system. Um, I have several versions. Everybody can replicate this. this are, these are two samplers. Um, I'm on my work table. I've got a sweater drying rack that, you got at, that I got at Walmart. And I've got a couple of bowls of water underneath. I've got some tall candlesticks. I'm going to tent it with a piece of painter's plastic. And I just tuck it under and make sure no air can escape. And I just leave it alone. What you want to be sure of is to check it, because you don't want humidity to build up so that you end up having drops of water on top. I'll let things hydrate for a long time. I check them every day, obviously. It works miracles. I could not put a needle in those samplers because the fibers would break. I could then stitch them to a mount. Um, I've got things on a much bigger table in the other slide. Same principle. You just need the surface that's big enough. And anybody who has cats, <laughs> keep them out of the room. <laughs> but you can see what, the, what I was able to do once I could get a needle in there. My husband, God love him, is a very handy man. And um, 
I had to hydrate an 18th century wedding dress from uh, Elizabeth Monroe, who was James Monroe's wife. And we had to take it apart anyway because it had been remade in the 19th century. So each panel of silk had to be hydrated separately. Uh, he made me this great little screen. Um, the screen, which is, again, fiberglass screening that I stretched across PVC pipe. And there's, you can't really see, but underneath there's a support for the screen. And then PVC pipe to create a support for my um, plastic. And that's how we hydrated them. It was great work with. And there's the frame at the James Monroe Museum. <laughs> okay. Silk, uh, your, your um, animal-based fibers take longer to hydrate than, uh, than cellulosic fibers, your linens and cottons. So we calculated that each panel needed six hours to hydrate. And here we go. Here's what a panel of the skirt looked like, panel A, before it was hydrated. I mean, it literally was falling apart like cornflakes. I'm not kidding. Um, and then when it was through, we were able to put a whole backing on it. Now, that is a little bit the testament of a quality piece of fabric to begin with. But still, I also have done some archaeological stuff, same thing. Um, it's truly amazing. I, I cannot say enough about hydrating textiles. Sewing stabilization, it's just fancy mending, good quality <coughs> mending. Um, this was a little baptismal gown. Um, which I ended up being able to replace some components and back others. And it was able to be used again by the family. Here's my Steve elephant again. I just love this thing. Um, he was made in 1901, by the way, and he was a riding elephant. Oh, yes. uh, and the moths really had a field day. And for that, oh, well, I'll show you later, but for that, we ended up finding fab dyeing fabric to match as an underlay so that you really couldn't see it. So did. By hand? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no machine goes in. <clears throat> Machines are too rough to use in a conservation preservation um, context. If anybody has old quilt tops and they would like them quilted, don't ever send it to somebody who's doing it on a long arm machine. It's too hard on those textiles. You know, you're already talking a 50 or 60 year old piece of fabric. My 50 or 60 year old face couldn't handle uh, the tattoo artist. It wouldn't. Uh, my skin isn't resilient enough anymore. Well, the same thing with the fabric. It's not resilient enough anymore. A hand quilting, yes, because it's more gentle and you're not manipulating the fabric. So that's why. Um, sewing stabilization here, we've done an infill, again, matching the fabric. This was for the DAR Museum. That same slide I showed you before, sorry about the quality of this one. It's kind of hard to see. But here, we were able to dye conservation net and put it over the brown. And it, it didn't make it go away, go away, but visually, it made it look OK. And you know, this is, this is part of it. For any of you with an institution, oh, I can't display that. You can display anything as long as it looks cared for and has a label that explains. Nobody expects a 100-year-old artifact to be perfect. They simply don't. You don't expect a 90-year-old lady not to have the occasional age spot on her. It simply isn't going to happen. <clears throat> My analogy for display is there's a bag lady standing at the bus stop. And you're going to go two steps away because she's got flies and she has her hair's a mess and all of that. You take that same lady, you dress her respectably, not fashionably, just respectably. She's clean, she's done her hair. Nobody's going to give her a second glance, including you. That's the difference. So yes, you can show that bodice that doesn't have a skirt. Yes, you can show whatever it is that has a stain that you know you can't get out. It's fine, as long as the visitor knows that you care about that artifact. They're happy to see it. And for God's sake, get it out of the drawer. If we don't show our children these artifacts, they're not going to know about them. And those artifacts will go away. We don't want them. That's me. I'm just an editorial. Sorry. <laughs> Finding a good dry cleaner. And I've got that in detail in my handout. Owner operated. A lot of these are chains. Now, right now, we're in a little bit of a crisis because of the pandemic. A lot of our smaller dry cleaners may not make it 
because nobody used dry cleaning services. But you do want somebody who the owner is involved in, in, in the operation. Um, dry cleaning is a little bit of a misnomer. Dry cleaning is not dry in the sense of not being liquid. Dry cleaning, when you wet clean something, the water actually penetrates the fiber down to the molecular level. And so when it dry, and then that fiber swells, okay? Dry cleaning, the, the, type, the chemical doesn't um, penetrate. It swirls around, removing whatever is on the surface. But to be dry cleaned at a dry cleaner, the artifact is put into a machine, and the liquid is poured in, and then it is agitated to get all the soils off. Well, you know, I'm not doing those agitation. I mean, I don't do step classes anymore. <laughs> and you don't want that for your vintage textile either. Um, and then the water is drained, the liquid is drained out, the fluid, and it is subjected to very high heat to evaporate the rest of it off. Again, I'm not baking in the sun anymore. I'm not going, you, you just got this out of an attic. You don't want it baking in heat anymore. So dry cleaning can be problematic. But you need to be able to dry clean things. There's all there is to it. Some of these things are in a condition where not even with gloves do you want to touch them. And this is the most amazing example. My business partner did this, known Confederate officer's coat. Um, it was, I mean, the guy brought it to her and she said, not until it's dry cleaned. I won't touch it. Because you can get sick off of some of the stuff. I mean, these things come out of barns sometimes with God knows what kind of rodent droppings on them. Uh, and here is what she did. Now, that's not just the dry cleaning, but it is dyeing to match the wool and doing all the stitching to hold down. It's possible. Now, I will tell you, her fee for doing that was $6,000. Wow. Okay. He sold it for 45. Yes. He sold it for 45. Wow. Could you go back to the, to the sure. slide real quick again? Wow. wow. That's one of our more, more extreme examples. Wow. Yeah. yeah. What does that mean, netting? Oh, the I'm going to get into that. It's conservation netted. When you something is really uh, got holes in it, you want to stabilize the holes so they don't get any bigger. Yeah, we use netting. So that on. Yeah, by hand, by basting, hand. one inch yeah. stitches. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, to hold it in place. It's instead of pins. Yeah. Sure. Um, dry cleaning again. That 1940s satin wedding dress with the, had three brides wear it. And the footprints of the guys on her train were visible. <laughs> <laughs> it's that lovely rayon from the 40s and early 50s that really great stuff, they don't make it anymore. It's wonderful. Um, it cleaned like a charm. Uh, it cost $300 to clean it. Not to clean it, to iron it. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, oh, sure. <laughs> um, that little 1940s dress uh, that she wore, um, to clean that was $35. I mean, dry cleaning can, doesn't have to be expensive. It's whatever needs to be dry cleaned. And we can talk about that more. Today. Conservation wet cleaning. Um, these were found in an attic of one of the earliest houses in my hometown of Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, all of the clothing up there had the, the furnace, when they installed the oil furnace, they vented it into the attic. So, but this is the result after careful cleaning. There's no bleach involved. I don't bleach things. But you have to be careful. Here's a dress. This one's silk. We dry cleaned it. You can see what it looked like before, and then you can see what it looked like when we got it. And she was in pretty rough shape. This is Dumbarton House, national headquarters of the colonial dames in, in, in America. Um, and it's Martha Washington's great-granddaughter who wore them. 
Your supplies are pretty simple. Um, you want to, if you're going to do wet cleaning, you want to keep things supported at all times. Remember I said that the water goes into the fiber and swells it? Well, it makes it heavy. Think of your bath towels. Anybody had a kid on swim team? Those towels are heavy. You never want to manipulate your fabric when it's wet. And that means the family christening dress or your own cashmere sweater, okay? Because that's when a rip is going to happen. You always want to keep it supported. I use fiberglass screening. It's cheap, it's easy, it's light. You can use a sheet. <laughs> you can use muslin, doesn't matter. You just want to create a sling. Put it in a sling. Um, sometimes I have, I have um, in the Asian food stores you can buy, they look like colanders, but they have very tiny holes, and it's what the gals use to rinse the rice. And I have a big bowl into which one of those bowls fits, one of those um, colander type things. So I can just manipulate colander when I'm manipulating my small things, handkerchiefs, collars, that kind of thing, baby dresses. Um, you want a container that's large enough to hold your artifact. A bathtub, a bath, bathtub works. Be careful if you're back. <laughs> um, I like, again, the screening. You've got to have it in the screening. For museum textiles, now there is a distinction between things that are entrusted to the care of a museum and things that are family heirlooms, just like we had this small discussion here about the quilt. Um, for my museum textiles, I'm much more careful about what I use to clean. Um, but Orvis paste, and for those of you who are familiar with, with farming, Orvis was de designed originally to wash horses. It is what ivory snowflakes used to be before they stopped making ivory snowflakes. Mm -hmm. um, it's great, it, but it, the only thing it is is sodium lauryl sulfate, nothing else. No perfumes, no whiteners, no brighteners, no nothing. So it's an anionic surfactant, surfactant is a soap. To really clean something, you also need a detergent, which is non-ionic, which is an ionic surfactant. I get it confused sometimes. A non-ionic surfactant. Yeah, there's non-ionic and ionic surfactants. Detergent and soap, the difference. The two together is what you really want to clean something. And for that, you can use commercially prepared, um, I use all free and clear. Good old all. Um, sometimes you can use Dreft. But you have to be careful on all of these commercially available products that you get at the grocery store in the cleaning aisle. Make sure that the manufacturer hasn't changed the formula. Because as we keep moving to synthetic fibers, they keep changing the formula because, of course, people who are buying this stuff is buying it for their own grocery, their own families. But all free and clear has both ionic and anionic surfactants. It has very minimal optical brighteners. Optical brighteners are the, is the chemical that makes your t-shirt glow in the dark at the nightclub. Just what you want, attract more light. <laughs> but if you rinse it enough, it comes out. Here's a dress for the DAR Museum, dated 1810, on a screen, soaking in a tub. Um, I use a lot of those rubber-made under-the-bed storage boxes. You don't need much water, huh? just enough. Three, four inches is all you need. Here's what the water looked like after just plain water soaked it out. You can use tap water. If you are in a hard water area, please add Calgon. It doesn't harm the fabric at all. Um, if you can, rinse it in distilled water the last time, because you're never really sure what's in your tap water. But just plain water is a great solvent. Here's the dress drying, supported. I've got fans running. Um, anything that has a dimension to it, I pad. These are actually one of that towel that you see was one of my daughter's swim team towels from you know 30 years, 20 years ago. Uh, the towel is perfectly good. It looks like hell, but it's nice and soft. It's nice and soft. And there she is, ready to for display. Mystery stains. I love this, and it's a Colorado quilt. I don't know if any of you remember the community quilt movement 
from uh, the 1970s and early 80s, where each community got together and one each person made a, um, a square with something about their town, the church, the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Well, this is from um, Vail, and it was displayed in the library behind the, the desk. It was made by uh, the community and put together by one woman, and one woman, I think, handed out the packets, and then she put together the quilt. And throughout the quilt, wherever there was white, it had turned brown. We still don't know why. We think, I think, finally, determination. She must have worn hand cream. That's the only thing we can think of, is that she used hand cream. Well, the other problem with this quilt is that it's got lots and lots of embroidery on it. And I mean lots of embroidery. And there was a tiny window of time in the 80s, early 80s, late 70s, where the embroidery floss, I think, was sent overseas to be made, I think. I, I, this is a research paper that hasn't been done. Anyway, you get it wet, it explodes. I had some quilts do that to me, some cross-stitched quilts. The, the floss exploded. Well, I knew I couldn't wash this puppy, because <laughs> I tried one little square. And sure enough, that floss started to disintegrate in front of my eyes. It's a flaw in the manufacturing. It's a very narrow window of opportunity. It happens to have been a period in time when needlework was going towards cross-stitch and embroidery. So you have to be careful. You have to be careful. In what years? Yeah, late 70s, mid 80s. It's really narrow. And again, I haven't talked to DMC. I haven't talked to, you know, I don't know what the common denominator is. Like I say, this is a thesis project for somebody. Probably not me. <laughs> <coughs> um, what were we going to do? Oh, let me go back. Well, I'll tell you what we did do. I made a paste of, I think it was Tide. And I used egg beaters, and I put a tiny amount of water, a certain amount of the detergent, and I whipped it up with my egg beaters into a froth, and I painted it on all of the clouds and the mountaintops, et cetera, et cetera. And I let it dry. And I brushed it off, and I vacuumed it off. Wow. And it worked. Now, it, sometimes I had to treat place a couple of times. This is an old-fashioned way to clean upholstery. Why did you choose Tide? It, I thought it had the best cleaning properties. These Rather fab than the, all three of the Orbits? That's right, because I thought, I, I, by the time I figured out that it was what I thought was hand lotion, I thought that's grease-based. Okay. I wanted a detergent. And Tide is pure, just the, the Tide powder. So, I mean, it was, a, it was an experiment. They knew it was an experiment. You know, this came through two other conservators who said, we won't touch it. <laughs> what was the concoction? It was just tied in a tiny bit of water. And I, and it, I it, it looked like egg whites, like, like a meringue. And I painted it on. If you look up an old, in mid-20th mid century household, uh, uh, household hint books, you'll find hints to Halloween. How do you clean upholstery? That's one way. It's a very useful thing to know. And as I say, keep, be sure to rinse thoroughly because I hope you can see all that brownish stuff on the back of that quilt. Guess what? They didn't rinse. It had been to a conservator to be washed. She didn't rinse enough. And how do you find out if, you, if it's rinsed enough? I taste the final rinse water. I'm going to taste soap. You don't swallow it. It's like a wine tasting. You spit it out. <laughs> like I said, this, none of this is rocket science. It's, and, and you know all this stuff already. You just haven't taken this knowledge and applied it in this particular um, field. So here I am washing a quilt. Um, it happens to be my quilt. It was made in 1780, 1785 to 1795, we know from the fabrics and from the construction. She was a wreck. She was filthy. It, it was going to the DAR Museum, and I knew she needed wet cleaning. I bought it 
1977. It was peeking out of the bag that my, the lady that I was working for for the vintage clothing store, she'd been on a buying trip in central Pennsylvania, and just a corner of it was peeking out, and I went, that's mine. I don't know what it is, but it's mine. <laughs> and it's absolutely spectacular. But anyway, so my quilt tank, it's two by fours that have been notched like Lincoln logs. I cover it with a big sheet of painter's, tape, painter's plastic with cl wood clamps. My husband took me to the lumber store. He says, you want clamps? Let me show you clamps. <laughs> <laughs> and then to drain it, my, my, my garden is on a bit of a slope. Mm -hmm. I just lifted up one of the Lincoln logs, flattened the plastic out, mm -hmm. and away we went down the driveway. Mm. Um, I do that for rugs, too. Uh, and then I put, I was able to hook my hose up to the laundry sink and stretch it out for warm water. But I've also been known to just have people haul buckets of warm water initially. And you really don't have to have hot water to do wet cleaning. You really don't. Storage systems and containers. Hanging storage. Hanging storage is the most effective kind of storage if you don't have much space. I've known uh, collections that use um, dry cleaning dry cleaning systems or everything, because it takes up much less space, provided you've got them on de decent hangers. Um, you can have them on racks covered with either sheets or Tyvek. Tyvek is a wonderful conservation fabric. Buy it through the conservation catalog, it costs you a fortune. Go down to your local builder. He's got all kinds of scraps hanging around. Just put it through the washing machine. Take the ink off. It's the only difference. The builder's stuff has been stamped with whatever it says. Just wash it. It's still Tyvek, and it's a great, great fabric. Hangers. We have a wonderful example of good hangers. You can make your own. It's a great intro, intro to um, vol for your volunteers to make them. It doesn't take much skill, um, but you do want to cover them up. You don't want wood. Wood has acid. You don't want plastic. plastic. Plastic leeches, um, chemicals. Um, also, historic garments, anything before really the 80s or the 70s, because ladies from the 60s had small shoulders too. Anything before Title IX, sports in school. <laughs> You're smaller up here because guess what? You weren't, for the most part, rowing crew, playing soccer, or on the swim team. Women weren't. So their rib cages were small. I mean, we were just plain smaller. We weren't less fat. <laughs> we just didn't have the upper body strength. Rolled storage is great for one-dimensional textiles. Don't roll your quilts. Please don't roll your quilts. Oh. Yeah. If you're stuck, you're stuck. But here's the problem, and you can see it yourself if you take something that's three-dimensional or you do, the inside layer scrunches mm -hmm. and the outside layer stretches. I have a yoga mat. I also have um, something to cushion my yoga mat. If I roll them together, they separate out, right? That's what's going to happen. You're going to get stress on your quilts. So shawls, table linens, um, anything that's one-dimensional, scarves, Laces are all great rolled. And now you see here, this is table linens and a lace. I've got a toilet roll there wrapped in aluminum foil. Mm -hmm. Aluminum foil is your best barrier. It's so low tech, you get it at the grocery store, but it'll keep all the acids away. Yeah. So you can use boxes, provided it's the right size box, just cover it all with aluminum foil inside. You don't have to spend money at Hollinger or Metal Edge. Now, I wish you did. I mean, I wish you would because they're better. But this is great. If you're starting from scratch, aluminum foil, and your volunteers feel comfortable using things like aluminum foil. It doesn't intimidate them. So whatever works. Um, 
that uh, table topper, I think that was a tube from the fabric store. Again, you can buy acid-free tubes. But I use mailers, I use tubes from the fabric store. I, you can use wooden dowels. You could even use PC, PVC pipe covered with aluminum foil. So you go to the hardware store and get PVC pipe. It comes in all kinds of sizes. Flat storage. You can do all kinds of things. You can retrofit. This is Winter Tour on, uh, on your left. Uh, they took, uh, I think that was originally a window. They converted it into, into shelving. Uh, Maryland Historical Society was unpacking the attic. They had a place to put all this stuff. They made their own makeshift storage system with acid-free cardboard at the phone blocks. It worked for six months. It was fine until they got around to you know, changing out their storage. Um, or big bucks, Philadelphia Museum. Mm -hmm. Shoes and hats are clothing too. These are all um, mounts that were made for very little money at the uh, Genesee Museum in New York. Uh, that inherited the Susan Green collection of, of costumes and textiles. We'll know more about Susan Green later when we talk about quilts. She wrote the amazing story of textiles uh, book. And it's on your bibliography. But again, um, the hat mounts are made from acid-free board that they've cut to shape. They've covered it with felt. Um, it's great. It's just batting. Stockinette is another good good thing to buy. Stockinette is what the medical folks sell. They put it on your arm before you get your cast. The Lymphoma Society sells it too for women who have had breast cancer and they have problems with swelling. But Stockinette is great stuff. You buy it in 25 yard rolls, so go in with somebody else. You want to wash it first because it's starched and it's got all kinds of stuff. But it's fabulous stuff. And it comes in 2 inch, 4 inch, 6 inch, and 8 inch. And 8 inch will stretch over a mannequin. So, you know, and it'll protect, it helps protect stuff. OK, how do we box a garment that's too big for the box? First, you have your box, which is properly prepared. You have your muslin. A clean top sheet is fine. It can be used. It can have a hole or two. That's fine. But it's got to be a top sheet. Bottom sheets and pillowcases have body oils. You can't ever get rid of the body oils. Nothing that you can do will get rid of the body oils. And we all know that. We've been in our grandmother's linen closets, and there's a slight whiff. That's your body oil. It's just a fact. And it cannot be laundered out. But top sheets don't get that. So if you're using old sheets, and it's OK to use a blend. Polyester's going to be around long after we're all dead and the cockroaches have taken over. <laughs> Place your garment so that as much of it is flat as possible. And you start to layer in your skirt. These are sausages made from acid-free tissue. You can make sausages out of quilt batting. You can make sausages out of tube socks. You can make sausages out of stockinette. Whatever, you just want some sausages. Again, the enemy of a textile is a crease. We've all been there, the tablecloth with the hole in the middle, because that's where it was folded. Um, you, want to f you want to fold them irregularly. And you keep folding her in, as you can see. And then the party's over, she's going to bed. <laughs> How to fold a quilt. I'm going to demonstrate this later, but this is the this is the cliff nose version. You want to fold it randomly at first. Don't measure it, nothing. Just take one side and flip it. Six inches, eight inches, eleven inches, four inches, doesn't matter. Flip it. Turn it around, flip the other side. Again, six inches, eight inches, four inches. Not the same amount as you first did, but you want random. Then you start to fold it, because now you're not going to be on a crease line. And at that point, you have to figure out how to fold it to fit in the box. But random is the answer, because no matter how many times you refold that quilt, you're never going to do the random fold the same way twice. Simply. Statistically, it's not going to happen. <laughs> when disaster strikes, 
how are we doing on time? And it does, we all have disasters. There's fire and smoke, flooding and mold, moths and carpet beetles, God help you. <laughs> fire and smoke, they're the worst because everything is being burned and everything is in that ash. Plastics are in that ash. Fabrics are in that ash. Cardboard is in that ash. And it's all in your textile. It's gonna be need it's gonna be need to be cleaned twice. Wet cleaning and dry cleaning. Because wet cleaning isn't gonna get what was deposited from oil-based whatevers. Fire extinguisher stuff on it. But as you can see on this rug, and this is how it came out of the fire. She was lying flat on the ground. Nothing got to the surface, to, to, to the back. I forget if that's the back or not, but at any rate, one side got hit and the other side didn't. Floods, this came out of Hurricane Katrina, 2001. Um, 18th and early 19th century uh, lace mitts. Again, that sludge, that sludge. But it wasn't oil-based. I was able to wet clean it. And to dry them, we get our newspapers in plastic sleeves. I just crumpled up a whole lot of newspapers into a plastic sleeve. I mean, a lot of plastic sleeves into another plastic sleeve. And I created a three-dimensional form to dry that lace on. Worked like a charm. Flood recovery, oh God, flood recovery. OK, rule number one. If you can't get it dry right away, keep it wet and freeze it. Keep it wet and freeze it. Mold is your enemy here. Mold. Dampness creates mold. And I hate to tell you, mold is everywhere. Everywhere. Until it is activated, you don't care. But you get it in a humid, warm setting, and it gets, you get a mold bloom. They call it mold bloom. And those stains, by the way, never come out. They change the fabrics of the molecular level. So handle your wet textiles with extreme caution. Because again, I said to you before, when they're wet, they're heavy. When they're wet, they tear. So get it on some kind of a support if there's any way you can. If it's still in the box and the box is wet, that's fine. That's your support. Don't unfold it until at least it's damp. You Interleave. Mean, you mean not dry, or do you mean not too wet? Not too wet. Okay. Okay. And that's true when you are wet cleaning an artifact. You want it to get slightly damp, or not too wet before you start to smooth it out. Oh, it's, it's all in your handouts. Interleave the layers with wax paper. Again, grocery store, wax paper. But nothing will transfer through. Uh, we went into the National Guard headquarters um, in New Orleans for an Angels project, the uniforms had sat for a year, a year after the flood. They weren't allowed back in the building. When we got there, the metal buttons had corroded on the uniforms, and they had created holes all the way to the back of the garment. If anybody had been able to get in there, all they would have had to do was put some wax paper between the between those buttons and everything else. Keep the lights on 24-7. It inhibits mold. Mold does not like bright lights. Remove the mud and pollutants by flooding with cool water. You have a helper. You get your water in a hose, and you gently, for the, with the garden sprinkler attachment on gentle, you just want to get rid of that stuff. Air dry with lots of air circulation. Fans are good. Hair dryers are bad. You want it to evaporate naturally. You want those fibers to shrink slowly. You don't want those fibers to suddenly go. <laughs> That's not good for your garment. If you can't get all of this done within 48 hours, then find a freezer. A chest freezer would be great. Any freezer will do, but a chest freezer is. So find in your community who's got the chest freezer. 
You know, is it the 7-Eleven? Is there a meat packing plant? I mean, who's got a chest freezer? Um, but this is a fabulous website. I'm not sure I have it in my handout. I think I do. But um, it's the Northeast Iowa Library Service has got an amazing website for this because they went through devastating floods about 10 years ago. And they really got their act together. There's lots of resources online. Mold, good old mold. We see it on uniforms. We see it on wool suits. We see it on leather all the time. If it's on leather, saddle soap. Good old saddle soap. Um, if it's on clothing, dry cleaning actually works. Brush it, brush it. Get rid of it as much as you can with a brush. But then dry cleaning kills mold spores. You know, fit, fix the climate story, the climate control in your storage unit. Vacuum, brush, and wipe with damp cloth. Dry cleaning will kill the mold spores. Chlorine kills mold, but obviously you're not going to do that on something you can't wash. Um, keep them in the light for 24-7 and preventative care um, when you get back to normal, 50% relative humidity, 68 degrees. This is in the best of all possible worlds. I know, we aren't all there. <laughs> For moths and carpet beetles, go to church, say some prayers, <laughs> then come back and deal with it. Um, integrated pest management is, is difficult. Um, I'll tell you an anecdotal story about a situation that nobody saw coming two-story building. Uh, curatorial offices were above storage. Storage was on the first floor. Curatorial offices were on the second floor. Um, you know, people had lunch at their desk, right? And they put whatever was left in the trash can, and it gets emptied, what, once a week? Twice a week, if you're lucky. The bugs found it. Well, there was this little tiny hole in the floor. Went down into storage. This was in, this was in uh, a museum in New York State. Follow the bugs. Find out where it started. <sighs> Find your source of entry. So, okay. Um, vacuum thoroughly. They lay they lay webs. There are larvae in pockets. Um, there are systems that they'll sell you to remove all the oxygen. They don't work. <laughs> Dr. Ordonez had a carpet beetle in a baby food jar on her desk. Tightly sealed jar. No air. That sucker was alive for two years. <laughs> They're awful. <laughs> um, pheromone traps work great for moths. You get them on Amazon. They're little boxes. You've seen them for pantry moths. You want the one for clothes moths. It traps the female. Males fly around with nothing to do. They die. So that's a really good preventative. But there is no substitute for good housekeeping. Vacuuming, dusting, making sure everything's clean. Now you can get rid of an infestation also, at least anything that's in the actual textile, by freezing. You can freeze them. And then I have the how to do it in my handouts. You can also microwave. Right, right. I mean, you don't microwave metal. I always put a little cup of water in my microwave. I'm not talking big objects, obviously. But say somebody brings you something wonderful, a weaving that's small, and you want to put it in your collection, but you don't put anything in your collection until you know it's clean. You have to have a separate spot to put any donations until you're sure they're clean. Um, otherwise, you could be asking for big trouble, and expensive trouble. So just put it in a big sealed plastic bag until you have time to, to, to do it. And here's the Cliff Nose version. Packs your textile in three millimeter polyethylene sheeting. Um, Ziploc bags work. Remove as much air as possible. Freeze for 48 hours. Take it out and let it thaw. Put it back in the freezer. Any larva is going to sprout, and then you put it back in the freezer to kill whatever hatched. And vacuum. 
the bejesus out of it. <laughs> Temperature must be below 5 degrees or 20 degrees Celsius. Again, chest-style freezers. Your home, your home freezer isn't going to do it. Commercial and residential freezers can be used. Temperature is key. Chest-style freezers are most reliable as are walk-ins. And the frost-free cycle is OK. You will read some old postings that you can't put it, that you shouldn't put it in the frost-free cycle. Don't worry about that. It's fine. <coughs> Again, museumpest.net, solutions, low temperature, treatment. There's a lot of good stuff on the internet. Just don't let it happen. <laughs> you have to take everything out of storage. I'll give you another anecdote. I work for the United States Navy at the Navy, the Navy Museum, which is a quasi-government private group. It's supported by the Navy Heritage and History Foundation with an admiral in the engineers. That's the director. Doesn't know a museum textile from a baseball bat. <laughs> Staff knew there was a mold problem in their storage. They knew it. They knew where it was. It was in the back corner. They kept asking for money. Finally, they got their money. And they did the survey. The Navy Times got news, got word of the fact that there was mold in the collection. It was a scandal. Talk about a tempest in a teapot. So the Admiral, in the dark of night, had every artifact taken out of the entire storage area and shrink-wrapped on pallets. He created Petri dishes. He didn't label where they came from. It was a nightmare. And then they sat in a warehouse. And my partner and I were brought in to try and fix that one. We lost the top. The top was uh, lost to history. But we were able to hydrate the skirt and petticoat. We did sewing support for both. We reassembled them the way they had been assembled. And that's another story we won't go into. We printed new fabric to make a, a bodice. Um, we reproduced that bodice based on another garment of hers in the collection. And we customized the mannequin, and there she is. And she's going back on display, by the way. My partner was mounting her uh, last week. Another happy ending, you saw this before uh, quilt uh, for Shattered Silk. This was, quote, made by a slave, unquote. The kissy quilt in the Anacostia Museum, very famous quilt. Well, no, it wasn't made by a slave. And I just went through this with another institution. Yes, the maker was born into slavery, absolutely. But she was not a slave when she made this. This is an 1880s show quilt in the same family as the crazy quilt. She had attained middle class status. She had made this beautiful embroidered show quilt, parlor quilt. But this thing needed to be seen by school children. What were we going to do? Well, I go back to you can show anything as long as it looks like it's cared for. All of the sashing was gone. The sashing of the beads between the, the, the six squares of embroidered. I replaced the sashing with very, very similar matching silk. Immediately, it started to look better. And then I used conservation net to consolidate. Can you see the net? In the picture, you can. In real life, you can't. Uh, it's a trick of the light of the photography. But now you can handle it. So that's a quasi-conservation um, restoration project. And another happy ending. A friend of mine um, got this in uh, from Martha Katz Hyman, actually. It's part of her family. She was the uh, slave curator at Williamsburg for many years. Um, and Martha said, this, my grandmother made this, these cushions. Uh, it was from a quilt she never finished. Let me tell you, there are lots of quilts out there that weren't finished. Um, I don't want it to look new. I want it to look like it should look. And that was hard, because it was washed out. It was faded. But we did it. And I love this picture because there's the scrap basket we plowed through to find the right scraps. Being a conservator means I have a license to be a pack rat. <laughs> and this is the happiest ending of all. 
this quote came to us. Now, the star was already not centered on the rectangle. Okay. Here's what happened, and it's an Oklahoma piece. I think it's an Indian-made piece. I can't be sure. So we cut it off, fixed it, and now she has it on display. That's extreme, but it's a private piece. She wanted to save it. The important part was saved. Thank you. The rule of thumb for textiles is six months, push it to a year. So most, pa most places will trade it out every year. You don't have to trade everything out, just the garment or the quilt or the whatever.